Paul. I hear you are looking forward to the next satisfactory update. I haven't been paying attention. I didn't even know one was on the horizon. Yeah, supposedly it's coming to Experimental uh, tomorrow on, on the date of release, so it'll be Tuesday. All right, so what are we getting? What are we getting? What are uh, we getting? We get... Can we escape the planet? Well, last time it was, yeah. Last time it was it was pipes, right? Like they they said the whole time, oh, there's not going to be fluids, not going to be pipes. You guys stop asking. And then update three was, oh, actually pipes. <laughs> right. So update four is slated to be gases. There's going to be uh, a bunch of things, other things you can put in pipes instead of instead of fluids, or instead of liquids, I guess. And uh, they're redoing tier. The nuclear tier, I think, is moving up a tier or something. They're redoing some of the tiers and adding a few parts and moving stuff around, changing a bunch of stuff. So, like, tier 7 and 8 are uh, are going to be redone. So, all that end game stuff is going to break. You know, I keep wanting to play it, and then I realize, oh, wait, i got to log in to Epic Game Store. And, <laughs> and I realize the game is for sale right now on Steam. And I seriously consider buying it on Steam just to have it on my preferred platform, but that's such a waste oh. of money. Yeah. I just that's I'd how like they to have get it you. in my list. Yep. I'd just like to have it in my list. I should have waited. I mean, but I really liked the look of the game. And so I paid for I could just think of it. I paid for it, you know, to play it a year early. I paid extra. If someone was coming out with the System Shock remake, I would have paid years early to play that. <laughs> yeah. So I'm looking forward to redoing my base and adding even more spaghetti all over the place. It's going to be fun. Oh, that's yeah. right. I forgot how the crazy way you build. The, the other thing that made me <laughs> want to go back to the game is I saw some other people that, you know, I get more and more fastidious and it slows me down. The advantage of your way of building is, of course, it's incredibly efficient. Like, you just need something, you put it down, and it works. And I'm like, okay, I need another thing to do iron. Well, first I'll build a building, and now I need to set up all those conveyor belts and route them everywhere. You know, it's the difference between throw the computer on your desk, plug it in, and begin using it, and bring in the computer and add, add it to your cable management system. You know, spend half an hour yeah, yeah. tying all the cables together and routing them under the desk, and... It's very quick to get things going your way, and my way is super time-consuming. And uh, it, I often, like, just get burned out, like I'll spend most of a session just making things tidy and not actually um, making progress. Yeah, I, I do occasionally get into like, oh, I, I should build a building and make everything square corners and like organize and stuff. I did that with my uh, copper, copper production or copper sheet production. I made a whole building for copper sheets and, and that was fun. But yeah, it does. It does get uh, a little bit too wearying for me. I'm just like, ah, I can't be bothered. I'm just going to add another conveyor belt on top of this conveyor belt. You know, you can add... Um, you can put conveyor belt stands on top of splitters. So if you if you don't have a way to route something, you can just add a splitter in the middle or or a joiner either way in the middle of a conveyor belt. Don't do anything with it. Don't add you know pipe you know you know conveyors to that thing. Just use it to route conveyors over the top of it. Oh, I see. It's just a stand for conveyors. Yeah, exactly. It's really really convenient. Yeah. So and then uh, with with gases, they're also adding new resource deposits, and it's got like two different buildings where you build like a pressurizer, and then like all the little vents spew up around the edge, and then you add like taps to the vents and stuff. So it's like a whole uh, a little bit more involved resource gathering as well. It, it looks pretty fun. I'm doing some more explora exploration and some more shooting r monsters and things. I should probably just wait until the game comes out because I tend to go all the way to the end of the current tech tree and then quit and then the next update comes out and then I just start over at the beginning. And oh yeah, that could take a long time. So, yeah, so I end up playing for a week and then seeing a little bit of new stuff and that's no fun. 
So I should just I should just have some self control and just wait for it to come out. All right. So Creeper World Four. You know, I know it has nothing to do with Minecraft creepers, but because I've spent so much time in Minecraft, I just, every time I see the term creeper world, I just think of being surrounded on all sides by creeper, by Minecraft creatures just heading <laughs> yeah, for you. sea. Yeah, and like, how do you, how do you not die in this situation? It's actually quite stressful. <laughs> it does, it does sound really stressful. Uh, so Creeper World, for those who aren't familiar, is a series of games made by a single man uh, who's developing these games. And they're kind of real-time, what, real-time strategy, uh, infrastructure management. Um, the, the hook is that the enemy, instead of being a single, like a bunch of single units, is a whole field. It's like a, 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 a fluid that you're trying to fight, and so it's kind of right. assaulting you on all angles from all sides kind of thing. Uh, which is interesting. And the downside is that because you don't have individual units, it it doesn't generally have a very concentrated attack. And he solved that a little bit in Creeper World 4. Um, Creeper World 3 is the one that I started the series with, and then uh, and this is 4. So he's added some enemy units that drop creeper or launch creeper or do things um and that's added a bit of of concentration of the assault but it's still not very concentrated so what you end up doing is you kind of build a, like a whole a whole wall around and then you just kind of push it back push back the tide basically interesting so yeah so i beat the game this past week and uh and that was fun the uh the missions the uh the story missions are that's the other funny thing about it it's like it's got this whole melodramatic story in all, all these games and they're all like full of like trans-dimensional wizards they're not even wizards it's all like science fiction-y kind of stuff but it's basically the same thing and there's like ai guys you know, hibernating for hundreds of thousands of hundreds of millions of years or whatever and all these giant numbers and like parallel universes collapsing and all this stuff but i don't know it, it's like it's in that weird it's like the narrative uncanny valley where it's not hard enough science to be believable but it's also not soft enough to be any fun and it's like too melodramatic to be funny but it's also <laughs> like not not uh not emotionally resonant enough to be to be moving so it's just kind of right. like in this weird uncomfortable it's like this it's like programmer art but for story for, for narrative i was just thinking i was just thinking along those lines it sounds like a programmer got stuck doing the writing yeah well it's this one guy who makes all these games like he just he does it he doesn't do everything but he contracts out like music or, or like some ui stuff or things like that. But I think he does do the stories himself because like that's part of what he really likes. And it's like, okay, it, <laughs> like that's fine. Um, there's no, there's no like skip dialogue button though, which is kind of annoying. Like you can hit, you can get around it by hitting escape and like bringing up the menu and then closing the menu again. And then like that'll skip all the dialogue. But then in some points in the missions, there's like this secondary trigger that comes on and then there's like a whole bunch more dialogue that's showing up on the screen and it's not voiced or anything um but it's still like these pop-ups keep popping up where there's like these different characters talking to each other is like ah uh, uh it's it's almost embarrassing that's the that's the terrible thing it's like it's not even bad enough to be embarrassing so it's not like groan worthy either it's just kind of like on that weird uncomfortable edge where it's just like uh, it's not anything it's just kind of there Right. So if anyone else has played Creeper World 4 or Creeper World 3, uh, chime in in the comments. Let me know what you thought of the story. So I saw, I just got done watching something really good on YouTube and I decided to talk about it on the show. I mean, like two minutes before I came into the show, I was looking at the counter. You know, okay, this thing has 10 mines left and I have to be at the die cast in 11 minutes. 
<laughs> this is the, a complete retrospective on the animation of Sonic games uh, by Daniel oh. Floyd. Daniel Floyd is the old, um, if you remember from, what was the name of the show? Extra Credits? Was that it? Where he had the chipmunk voice. His voice was pitched up. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah, think he yeah. was Extra Credits, the Extra Credits host. Yeah. He was he was the host, but James Portnow wrote the scripts, and Daniel Floyd right. read them. And... Boy, I like Daniel Floyd. I just, for one thing, I, I enjoy watching his videos just because he's a fantastic presenter. And he has a really positive, even when he's talking about a terrible game, he tries to keep it positive. That's something I always struggle to do. Like, saying, saying something is bad without, like, the people who did this are morons. And I wish I could sound more like Daniel Floyd. <laughs> Just keeping it positive and, hey, you know, sometimes things go wrong. Art is hard. And I always come off as like this drill sergeant of, and you mess this up, and you mess this up. What do you think you're doing here? <laughs> right? You call yourself a writer. Um, so I love his attitude. He's a great presenter. And animation is, like, I know a little bit of all parts of game dev because I've done a little of everything. Except animate. I, I've okay. Actually, I have done some animation, but I did it without training, and I had absolutely no skill or flair for it. I just sort of had to do it, and I was hand doing keyframe stuff. And of course, it was terrible. I was glad when our users stepped in and came up with you know far superior stuff. <laughs> right and. And I just, but then watching his, I'm like, oh, that's what I didn't know 20 years ago. <laughs> like I was messing around. I can't even remember the programs I used, but it was late 90s. Anyway, Daniel Floyd just did an hour and a half YouTube video going over all the animation in all the Sonic games. And... I find it incredibly educational. Even though I don't give a crap about Sonic, I don't know if I've even played a Sonic game. Like, what, you know, sit down at somebody's at somebody's Sega in the late '90s. I don't remember that happening. And just you know, playing five minutes. I don't oh, man, think I really. Yeah, I don't think I've ever played a single frame of Sonic. Even though you know, through cultural osmosis, I know a lot about it. My piano teachers teenage son who's like five years older than six years older than me at the time i guess he still is probably the same age older than me uh had sonic the hedgehog and so after lessons sometimes if my mom was late in picking me up i could like sneak into the other room and play some sonic the hedgehog on the yeah. on the incredible game console with the smooth motion and the incredible speed yeah, it's blast processing <gasps> um, so Highly recommended. I will put a link to this. I mean, it's an hour and a half, so it's an hour and a half video, and I know not everybody is up for sitting down and watching an hour and a half video, but if you have any interest in video game animation, this is very educational and just a charming video and wonderful to watch and just incredible production value. He did a great job. And like an hour and a half... Just for reference, you can beat the entirety of Sonic 2 in 16 minutes. So, like, an hour and a half, maybe he's just <laughs> speedrunning every game. We don't know. Well, he talked about he worked on this video for months. So I don't think he was speedrunning the games. <laughs> like, I, I didn't occur to me until just now, wait, how did he get footage? I mean, these were his, his footage of his playthroughs. That he was showing off and on like a 16 millimeter film camera <laughs> right how did you get footage of you playing on a sega genesis and all these days did you use emulators or or video capture or you know tv capture well how did this happen all the footage looked super crisp you know like tv capture often looks pretty crap but everything right because it's crisp. only 
like 320 by 240 or something. Right, and then and then you're and that that can be fine as long as it can stay pixelated so it's crisp and you see the pixel, you know, once you take mm, something like that true. and and blow it up to 1920 or actually 1080p and then you know there's big black bars on the sides cuz it's 4.3. Yeah. Um it's fine as long as whatever you're using to capture the footage doesn't scale it up to 1080p and then try and blur it out. Leave it pixelated yeah. and it'll look better. Because if you just turn it to mush, it looks so bad. Um, and oh. yet, all his footage, all his footage looked great. Okay. As a side note, I was helping one. My mom has an intern that was like doing her website on Wix or whatever, and she needed. A, a flat favicon and for those who don't know what that is it's the little tiny icon that shows up in the, in the little bar at the top of all your tabs of all your windows and you can see like the little play icon or the little you know gmail icon or whatever and so this, that's the favicon for your site and it's 16 by 16 pixels or sometimes 32 by 32 so it's a tiny little picture and uh i sent her one and she's like oh it's not going to work and like here's what it looks like on my screen and she sends me back this image of like the thing in her image viewer and it's just been scaled up so that it fits in the image viewer. <laughs> it's this blurry mess. <laughs> right. And I was like, Do you, uh, it's not going to look like that. Do you know what this is for? Like, you have no idea what this is for, do you? Right. Anyway. The other people have that problem where the, the, an artist will send something like that. My, my wife, Heather, has made websites for people and they're like, no, that's terrible, that's terrible, it's too blurry. And then they ended up, no, this is what I want. And they'll send her some, you know, horrendous 8K image <laughs> that's just uh -huh. supposed to, yeah. Animated GIF of a waterfall in Tahiti. <laughs> right. It's like 50 megabytes or something outrageous. And you're like, you know, you're, you're making things for the web. You're not making things for, for Hollywood. Stop doing that. Uh, yeah. All right. Okay. Animation and Sonic games. I'll have to look that up. That sounds really fun. All right. 100% Mindustry. What, what is this? So you've played Mindustry, right? Have you, have you played Mindustry? Uh, it's a version six, I think, since the update. This is the one that's like kind of a more abstract Factorio. Yeah. 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 I, I did actually play a little more of it like a few weeks ago. Okay. So you've seen the planet view. Um, have I don't remember. My brain no work okay. good. <laughs> so, so since in the latest update, uh, it used to be that there was just like maybe 12 missions or something or you know, eight, nine missions where you'd go from one and then you, it would branch off occasionally where you could go to different paths and do all these missions and then you're done with the missions. Um, and then if you want to play more, you could always go into the, the level editor and like make new missions to do, but they weren't part of the campaign. So now, in this latest update, the uh, missions take place in the context of a planet. And it's like an uh, icosphere that's been hex hexified. I think there's like 256 uh, spots on the map. And there's still, I think there's one more mission, one more story mission or, or two that weren't there before. But there's still a limited number of, of like intentional story missions where you progress through and you can get to the end of the game. But... There are also a whole bunch of other spots on the map that you can get to um, as long as you step one by one. So you can go to adjacent spots and then the story missions, you can jump a long distance to it to the next story mission, basically. So you can go all over the globe with the story missions and then you can work your way out from those capturing all these other sectors. Right. And, uh, and the, the reason you might want to do that is because the way the launch pads work now is instead of launching them to a... a group resource bank somewhere they instead launch to other sites on the map and so you can now reinforce your beachhead or whatever you, you like launch a core in and then have all these other sites send resources there so you don't have to gather any resources there you can just focus on building stuff and you know blowing up the enemies right so uh probably you'll end up capturing like five or six of these side missions in the course of the mission just because some of them will threaten your sites and so you want to capture those so that they don't so that your mission sites don't get captured and you have to go back and recapture them um but there is an achievement for capturing 
every site on the planet. And uh, as you might imagine, that would take quite a while. Right. Um, so I took quite a while and I, about <laughs> two weeks ago, three weeks ago now, or no, how long ago was it? Uh, maybe it was almost a month ago. I, uh, I beat the captured all of Serupulo or whatever the planet's name is. Every sector. And boy, oh boy, is that a lot of, <laughs> is that a lot of industry. And you're glad you did that. That certainly did improve your life significantly. Worth the time put into it. Yeah, so um, about that. I mean, I was, I was trying to figure out, like, okay, I did this. Like, how many other people have actually done this? And I, I ran some numbers, and probably less than 50 other people on the planet have captured every sector in Serupulo. Wow. So now you don't know if you should be proud or ashamed? Yeah, I'm kind of, I was kind of waiting to see if, if that number would go up, because it's at 0.01% of players have, have that achievement on Steam. So I was, I was hoping that would start to climb, but so far, no. So uh, it's a challenge to all you yeah. industry players out there. Yeah, if, if it grows, then you were just the first one to the summit. But if, if it doesn't grow, then it's like you were one of the only pr people dumb enough to do this. <laughs> right, right. And like now there are some achievements that are off limits for me, like the 500 wave achievement of like surviving 500 waves or whatever. Can't get it because like all the enemies are dead. There's no one left to fight. <laughs> Well, congratulations, I think. Or I'm sorry. Uh, thanks, I hope. How about some mailbags? All right, take our minds off ourselves. No, dear Diecast, this one is incredibly blunt and to the point. How do you feel about Miranda's ass getting downgraded in the upcoming remastered Mass Effect trilogy collection? It was such an important aspect of the game and its lore, the camera shots of her ass being an example of the series' superb cinematic presentation. I remember your analysis of the series had a long, detailed post about how Miranda's ass was one of the few things you liked about Mass Effect 2, and how her ass should have been its own game, because it, being in Mass Effect 2 felt like wasted potential. Best regards, a fellow gamer. Yeah, I thought Miranda's ass should have gotten its own spin-off <laughs> titles, honestly, so. Multiple games, I mean, I did, a whole series. I, I, I mean, I did all the loyalty missions for Miranda's ass, so, you know, those up. No, of course not. I, I love the idea that they're, like, there's less of her ass um, in the game now. And I'm like, that's a good start. Now let's get rid of the rest of her. <laughs> Um, it was, I'm just, it, my brain is just generating titles now, you know, like my ass effect. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it, it was such an odd thing. Like I, I have to be careful. I don't want to come off as a condescending, condescending scold. I do not like the attitude of, oh, you like this. You're a terrible person. You're gross. You, how dare you? you know, enjoy this sort of content. I dislike that. On the other hand, this was really crass. And uh, so the d distinction I want to make is, you know, salacious or lowbrow content like that, or just, I, I don't even want to, fan service, that's the word I'm looking for. Fan service like that is fine. But there's a time and place for that. And Mass Effect was obviously, you know, trying to present itself as a serious sci-fi story. And... Well, at least Mass Effect 1 was. Right. And even 2 had, you know, it was, this was not a comedy world. It's like The oh, Martian yeah. where, where De Matt Damon has to grow potatoes in his own poop on Mars to save himself. And what if somewhere in the middle of all that, a couple of girls in bikinis, you know, playing with a beach ball out on the surface of Mars inexplicably, and he went and hung out with them for a while. Like, 
okay, it's all right to have girls in bikinis in a movie if, you know, there are people that want that and there are people that want to make that. That's fine. You folks go have your fun. But it doesn't belong in the middle of this movie. This is not the time or place for that. And it undercuts everything around it. Like, I no longer take this world seriously. And, um, yeah, it just lowered the... It lowered my per, my appraisal of the entire game. Nobody else got this treatment. It was just this inexplicable, all of a sudden the cameraman, she adopts these completely unnatural poses for the camera while she's talking to Shepard. And it was such a bizarre thing. I mean, really, this should have been fixed before the game came out. Like, this should have been obvious. Everybody's like, what? Our game is not a place for this. This is silly. And, and not during a conversation. Right. Well, like and, kinda... and the weird thing is, like, it's not, it's not even good pinup material. Like, it's, it's no, not even... it's not good in that way either so it's like are you going to shoot for this or not because you're missing both targets at this point right right it wasn't like oh she's really hot that's a really sexy lady it's like her weird outfit looked like quilted paper towel like it was made of quilted paper towels <laughs> right and the pose looked super uncomfortable and her face had this uncanny valley like yeah it looked like a cross between the original actress who was very attractive i mean Probably still, I don't know. You know what I mean. An attractive actress yeah. and like Shrek. Like, what's wrong with her jaw? Right. Why is her jaw it's so too big? wide? It's and like, then she brags about like, everything about me has been engineered to give me an advantage. And it's like, really? Those engineers need to get their heads checked. <laughs> right? Were they human engineers? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> right, right. Oh yeah, maybe they're aliens. Who, what, what field of operations were you engineered to excel in <laughs> right oh just everything about those scenes made me uncomfortable I mean, even aside from the fact that i hated the dialogue in those scenes it was really annoying because you constantly want to like argue with her and you couldn't right or when you when it did let you it made you say something stupid <laughs> you know you want to say uh -huh. sir cerberus is you know stupid and, you know, Cerberus is stupid, and Commander Shepard goes, Cerberus is smarter than me, but they're not the smartest in the world, in the universe. And it's like, you know, no, that's not <laughs> what I wanted to say. Right, right. It's the, it's the, it's the author just like, stop hitting yourself, stop hitting yourself. <laughs> yes. And so those scenes were the worst part of the entire game where you're like, She's pretending to be a victim because of how awesome and perfect she is. Meanwhile, the cameraman is acting like he's making a porno. And then your dialogue wheel is working against you. And I just want to throw this person off my, my, my ship because they, they you don't belong in this story. What are you doing here? You're like a Buck Rogers character that wa wandered into a Star Trek episode. What's going on here? <laughs> Uh, and, and she's only the worst because she didn't have the competition from whatever that ninja was in Mass Effect 3. Emo Nightwing, Kai, Kai Lang. I just, on Friday, I just edited his big, my, the, the post. I'm, I'm turning the, like I said on the blog, I'm turning the, my Mass Effect series into a book. So I recently read all this. So it's all fresh in my <laughs> mind refreshed again. in your memory. All the things wrong with Miranda. Oh, so I like that they're changing it, but I also know some people are going to feel like, oh, they caved to all the scolds, and they just want to take this content out of everyone. Like, I can see that coming. I can see that coming, and that's going to be, that's going to start a few fights, and that just breaks my heart. When yeah, everybody if, should if be angry want, about Kai Lang... Right. Well, no. See, but that's in three, right? We can be angry about that in three, and this in two. Right. If you want uh, beautiful women uh, dressed up as Miranda, there is lots of cosplay on on the internet. 
I'll bet there are. I haven't seen any, but I'll bet you they're more attractive than the model they're based on, you know, than the original character. Yeah, hands down. Some some 20 something puts together this costume in her friggin' garage and it's better than what BioWare did with a million dollars. Yeah. Well, you know how the the models in Mass Effect are all just textures, right? Like they're the same right. body plan basically and they just retexture them for different outfits. Is that true? I didn't know that. Uh, well, maybe not exactly, but they're they're mostly they're mostly just textures. Miranda also has those thigh high boots, and that always looked like re really this is we're going on a space adventure, and you're will you're wearing paper towels and thigh high boots. This is <laughs> this is your getup. This is what you came up with. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so bad. You know, we you know what it reminds me of is that um, I can never remember the name of it. The uh, the space um, the space mech uh, ninja warrior game, free to play mech warrior thing. Warframe. 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 Yeah. Yeah, Warframe, where all like there's all those ships that are kind of like organic-y, but then they've got those seams on it, and like Miranda's outfit kind of reminds me of that aesthetic. <laughs> oh, it's boring. We'll just add more things to it. It's still boring. I think we have a boring bait. No, you just haven't added enough things to it. More hexagons. That's that's how I make music. Oh, this is boring. I'll add more to it, and then it's just this. I'll eventually <laughs> realize it's this cacophony of like overlapping sounds. <laughs> And it's just awful, and I, I delete it in shame. <laughs> That's what the Warframe design looks like to me. Somebody got to the end, and they have 12 different intersecting models, and they're like, Mwah, perfect, ship it. <laughs> right? The white noise of visual design. Yes. yes. Uh, it's like K Krieger. Was that? Or no, what was the, that Procgen thing that ended in all the white noise? I didn't. I don't remember how K K Krieger is teeny tiny executable um, proc gen shooter, but I didn't remember how it end. So oh no, it, it, was, it was something else. It was this again, like a super tiny proc gen thing, but it like turned into a whole music video or something. But then like it all ends in these overpasses, like sneaking their way through white noise. Anyway, we're way off topic. Let's uh, we need to go to the next mailbag probably. It's all yours. Esteemed Taris et Ecua. Eacula. Eacula? And my Latin's kind of old. Uh, the throwers of the By dice. By definition, everybody's says, Latin is old. Oh, burn. Okay. Currently on Kickstarter, there's a project for a dungeon generator that places room decorations randomly, but in what seem to be believable places, et cetera, et cetera. There's a link to the Kickstarter. The Kickstarter has been funded at like, 3,000% or something crazy. He got funded uh, he in says, three hours. Yeah. Uh, he says, I have no idea where this is going to work, but it looks pretty interesting. Uh, of course, one of the core layers of Clark's third law is any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from a rigged demo. So <laughs> evaluation of risk reward is left to <laughs> exercise the potential backer. Yeah, I, I feel it. it. It looks like they definitely did just do like a, a 3D mock-up of, of operation. I don't think they actually have a working piece of software uh but it looks really cool and it looks very doable i don't think there's anything difficult about that they say in the pitch that it's going to be like an ai dungeon builder but i don't see why they couldn't just use standard proc gen techniques it it wouldn't be difficult right the ai just introduces introduces a way for things to go wrong humorously yeah i i guess i the the main uh the main thing that i resented i suppose about this whole thing was that it would be really nice to have access to like how they're doing it so that it was a tool that you could use for other things too because i think it just right. generates images doesn't it or, or like you can export it into some sort of tabletop games or something right right that's the big purpose is to generate maps yeah that you print on your industrial printer and then hand out pieces of physical dead trees to other people at your table. I mean, it also works with you. Know, it's okay. I'm I'm being snarky. It's really to work with virtual desktop environments. So I'm sure the real goal is make image 
maps, and then everybody can see the map in the game. Well, they've got some sort of demo of like 3D geometry where you can walk around inside it with sight lines operational and stuff like that. It, I like it. It's cool. Uh, it just seems kind of like they're targeting it to a very narrow platform, and it seems like it's going to get locked in behind whatever endware or middleware they're using, and, and you won't ever be able to get the geometry out of it or use it in anything else. Because it'd be really neat right. to use that engine as a back end for some other game, like uh, Dungeon Siege or something. Oh my goodness, Dungeon Siege. That's a game that needed... Um... That's a game that really needed proc gen levels. Oh, yeah, that would have been sweet. So, uh, thank you, Doug, Sun, Seth, for the question. Yes, I think it's totally doable. I think they're going to succeed. I mean, they'd better with, like, what, 2 million euros that they raised? That's crazy. I did that. Okay, and Doug suggested that this ties into what I did. I didn't post the last entry in my proc gen series. I probably should. But yeah, I, I did this too. I made a system to generate furniture and place stuff in rooms. Um, maybe I should get around to posting the last entry of that. It's just one entry. Oh, yeah, I'd love to see it. That, um, I was really looking forward to seeing the progress. Is there just one more or are you going to keep working on just it? Just one. No, no, I, I finished it months ago, and I was like, oh, here's all my conclusions. And then I got distracted. I think maybe Cyberpunk came out, and then I just, you know, a month of my life vanished. Something like that. Was there a move or something in there? Maybe that was it. Maybe it was the move. Wow. Move was last summer. Crazy. Um, yeah, so, yeah, I kind of did this already. But it is interesting, and I'd be interesting to, interested to see how they did it um, and what sort of mm. parameters they used and how much control does the user have over it. Or will use, I suppose, because it's not. Yeah, yeah. you should back it and, and get a copy. Okay. Dear DieCast, do you think it's possible for a game to be narrative-driven and at the same time offer enough mechanical complexity or depth to be highly replayable? And if so, can you suggest a few possibilities? When I'm playing, for example, an RPG, I tend to run out of patience with the game's story long before I run out of new character or party builds that I want to try. Even if I liked the story a lot on my first playthrough, or my first few playthroughs for that matter, I end up resenting it in the end as, unwelcome ob as an unwelcome obstacle between myself and the parts of the game that still interest me. What's a designer supposed to do about that for a player like me? Thanks, John. So my answer to this is Immersive Sims. We're talking about games like Deus Ex. Um, games like Prey. Games like System Shock. Bioshock, kind of partial for the first few, first couple. Hmm. Um, the narrative is like, you want some narrative to give tension, to create tension and to give the story a direction so that you're not just doing the doom thing where it just drops you into this thing and you just wander around murdering stuff. But right. Or, or Minecraft where you're just like, I'm going to do a thing and like, there's no narrative structure. Right. But Immersive Sim does have a story. It exists to build a mood and tension, but it's very understated. So you're not going to like, there's not a big cutscene that you've got to watch at the beginning of every time you start one of these stupid games where the bad guy comes out and laughs at you and kills your village and I'm going to go take over the world, but leave you alive for some reason. Please don't train up and come and beat me later. We're looking at you, yeah. Rage. <laughs> right. Like, that's just harsh. But it does, uh, an immersive sim, the immersive sim that I like the best, being Prey, I guess, has lots of different builds you can experiment with. So you, you get a very different gameplay experience and different routes through levels. So you're like, well, what's it? Actually, Prey doesn't have as much. 
um, routing freedom as the old games did, like System Shock 1, you just like, okay, I know my goal is on level 3, but I'm just going to go sneak down to level 4 and say, oh my god, what is that? You know what, I'm going back up to level 3. <laughs> <laughs> But you can do that. You can you can sequence break, I suppose. It doesn't keep you boxed in too much. And uh gives you so you can try and do crazy things like, oh, I know there's a good weapon down on level eight. Do I have the guts to sneak down there past all the super dangerous stuff that I'm not ready for yet to get this one really good weapon? There's a lot of different ways to play it, a lot of emergent stuff from the mechanics to try. And while the narrative is there to keep the mood going, you know, to keep things feeling spooky or whatever, it's not, you know, people aren't calling you up on the phone every 10 minutes. Hey, did you did you shut down that computer yet? Oh, we really need to get that computer shut down. Hey, the next mission, I have another mission for you. Um, hey, have you heard about Sandra? That's crazy, isn't it? Right. This story is there, but they're n you're not constantly talking to people. And so I get a lot of replay out of those games. Now that's first person, which might not be what you're, you're looking for. If you're talking about a party of people, you're probably talking about some third party or th third person game. And I don't know about that. But for me, um, immersive sims are the magic sweet spot where... It's not just an abstract world. There is a story. There is a mood. I can get into that groove with it and enjoy that so it doesn't feel too abstract. But at the same time, it's not like just constantly bothering you with the story and everybody talking to you. And, you know, the first time your character falls in love with the love interest, it might be a little, okay, whatever, I guess this works. And then the, the fifth time your character falls in love with the love interest, it's like, who cares? Shove her out the airlock. She doesn't matter. That's not why I'm here. Sephiroth's going to kill her in the middle of the second act anyway. Exactly. Screw this. Who cares? Um, yeah, so immersive sims is my answer to that question. Hmm. My answer, as with all narrative uh, questions regarding games, is that if you're trying to tell a story, you should write a book or make a movie. And if you're trying to make a game, you should make sure that the narrative is in support of the mechanics, not opposed to them. So if the narrative is getting in the way... Yeah, well, so like in RPGs, like if the narrative is there getting in the way of the systems that you're looking at exploring, I'd feel like the RPG designer just has put too much story in. Now, narrative, you say narrative driven, and that kind of implies that the mechanical complexity isn't the draw. Like if, if the narrative is driving the experience, then maybe they put too much complexity in the mechanics. If you you know if you're if you're getting distracted by one or the other, it seems like they're clashing. Yeah, driven. I've seen people get caught up on driven. Some people when they mean driven, mean driven, they're talking about like it has a narrative. You follow the narrative to get to the end, but that doesn't mean it's necessarily you know omnipresent. Like in Mass Effect, you're always talking to people about plot stuff. Where in Thief games, you never talk to anybody except between missions, right? So right. you're like, trying not to you... talk to people in that game. <laughs> right. So walk up, strike a conversation with a guard and get a sword in the face. Um, so <laughs> it's not clear. Sometimes people, when they say narrative driven, they mean everything is all about the narrative and everything takes a back seat to that. And sometimes they just mean... Well, it has one, and it follows a narrative, so the narrative is the flow-through of the story, even though there's not... And other people just mean, yeah, it has a story. So, driven is is kind of a confusing word. Perhaps like we, you we, care I, to cl clarify, John. Right. Right. Doom, definitely not narrative-driven. Uh, Final Fantasy X? I would say very, you know, all those hours of cutscenes? Yeah, pretty narratively driven. But then when you get into something like Prey, would you call that narrative-driven? So what about like Half-Life? 
That's got a pretty right, strong that, narrative. Right, That's that's got a lot, and you're always following the plot, but people aren't always giving you updates on the plot. There's sometimes you spend a lot of time... Is that narrative driven? There's no, You can't leave the plot and just go dick around in City 17 and, like, do touristy stuff. Um, so is that driven or not? And I'll bet you you can ask several different people and get different answers um, on whether or not it's narrative driven or it just has a narrative or ah, the narrative's just a just a you know just an afterthought on top of the gameplay like there's how much is there in the game how much does it affect the game and then how much does the user care about it within the game yeah if it's just like gameplay is a gate to the next story beat and the story beat is skippable, then it seems like it wouldn't be much of an impediment. Right. So I don't know about that word driven, but I answered the, the question as best I could. All right. I feel like we've done a show. Another week has passed us by. Thanks so much for all the good questions, everybody. If you've got a question for the show, our email is diecast at shamusyoung.com. And we've still got a few questions left in the mailbag, but free, feel free to send us more. Thanks for listening, everybody. Say goodbye, Paul. Good night, everybody. Begun the recording process. I've fed the tape into the big, you know, the big reel of blank tape through the machine. Got it all threaded. Yeah, and we're rolling. And made sure it was the right way up. Right. Oh, <laughs> I pressed the giant toggle button, which you know moves the physical magnetic head close to the tape, so that it will begin recording our voices. And it made a giant ka -chunk, ka chunk noise when you push it. Exactly. <laughs> You got to use two fingers sometimes because it's just that right. much force. Right. But I mean, how else could you record anything without giant motors and moving parts? We might have to raise our voices <laughs> to talk motors. over. Right. We might have to raise our voices to talk over these motors. But you know, that's the cost of this cutting edge technology. And it doesn't go whir. It goes like. <laughs> Except that when you run out of tape, it's like flap, 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 flap. Because <laughs> it doesn't know.